Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode. So a couple months ago, I started doing a lot of deal analyses on investment properties here in Denver. As you guys know, those are all focused on rental properties. And as uh, I've been talking with a few friends, in this case, Derek Marlin of Elevate Elevation, uh, I wanna start doing some other deal analyses of the, what types of deals they're doing. And in Derek's case, he does a lot of like fix and flips. Right. So you know that's a world that I don't do, but I know a lot of people out there wanna get in that world. So. Derek's going to start doing some deal analyses uh, on the podcast here and start talking about deals that he's doing uh, and fixing and flipping. And in this case, deals he is not doing. Not doing, right. This is one of those you know deals that's always good to talk about where it's a no deal because it looked really good. You know, Derek ran through his process, a spreadsheet filter, and it uh, you know it did not pass the sniff test. Yep. So Derek, we'll talk about that today. Yeah, Chris, thanks for having me. And before we jump into that, we're actually recording this uh, either a day or two after we recorded your 2020 book interview, Correct. and we talked about your academy. And after yeah. we were done recording that, um, just talking some details about it. And you said for like the listeners out there, if people want to go register, you could give them the give them a special code, and they get some extras from yes. your team. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for mentioning that. We definitely want to bonus your listening audience. So if um, folks want to learn every step of our system, we've got a, the Elevation Academy. It's coming up July 23rd and 24th. Um, just kind of a small, small, you know, 12 to 15 person intimate group, um, socially spaced appropriately, of course. And um, for your listeners, we've got an ability to do a promo code. And if they enter DIRE, D-I-R-E, then we'll give them a special offer, which will be some actually one-on-one -on -one consulting hours to help them with that flip as they come out of our two-day training academy. Great. Yeah. And uh, they can just go to your website, right? Yep. So they can just go to elevationinvest.com and they can click the academy tab. And it's got all the details about our program and the ability to register. And then that promo code dire, and they can get those extra bonus hours. And I'll put the link in the show notes, but I know, you know, for academies, these are, you know, these, it's, it's the intense couple of days you're doing. Yep. If people have questions, they can reach out to you or some of your team to get more specifics, right? Yeah, absolutely. That's kind of our protocol is after they've looked at it and see if it's something they want more info on, we definitely do an exploratory call, make sure it's a good fit for both sides, answer any questions, give references, whatever they need, and make sure they're ready to go if it's something they want to do. Cool. Yeah, so if you guys are interested, I mean, definitely check it out. They can yeah. just, what, email you or? Yeah, they can email me directly, Derek at elevationinvest.com, or there's a option on the website where they can have it, you know, sent to me directly too, but they can just send it to me directly, Derek at elevationinvest.com. Perfect. Um, well, great, Derek. So let's, I know this uh, podcast came about because I don't know, a couple of weeks ago, we we're just talking about, you know, marketing yeah. and deals and what we're all up to and all that stuff. And you were just kind of started telling me about, um, you know, some deals you were doing mm -hmm. and some deals you're not doing, both for yourself and both on the partnership flip side. And this is one of the deals that uh, you ended up not doing. And I interrupt you halfway through, say, hey, dude, this actually be great to do a deal about yeah. this podcast because sometimes these are the even a better learning experience than a deal that you successfully did. I think it's always great to learn, hey, why did this one not pass this part of the, the filter process? Yeah, I think that's a great point because we talk about often the success stories, um, no matter how successful they are on a flip, because it's something that we've moved forward with. But, and it was probably maybe midstream of our Elevate Your Flip series where you had great questions about how many deals come into the top of your filter? How many do you analyze then getting downstream of how many do you move forward with? This is definitely one of those perfect examples of it looks decent at first glance. And then when you dive in, you quickly realize that it, it just wasn't a fit for us. And we'll talk about why. And this happens far more often, you know, probably nine to 10 times a deal we move forward with. We got to analyze eight to 10 deals for every one that might make sense. Okay. And so as we go through this, you know, I, I went through the slide deck right before there, there are some spreadsheets and numbers. So well, the video will be on YouTube or mm -hmm. also the images will be in the show notes on the blog post. If you guys want to see the spreadsheets, just click the link and you can scroll down to find those. So Derek, um, where do you want to start in analyzing this? Like what's the setup? Yeah. So what we can do is we can talk about, you know, we've already talked about the company and what we do. Um, but again, we're experts in the fix and flip field. We don't do uh, scrapes. We, we don't do much even pop top. It's truly just classic rehabs, whether that's adding square footage or just working through the existing layout. Um, so that's really the key part of our business. And this is, we're calling it the deal or no deal analysis, like the old Howie Mandel show. Um, I think it's even on CNBC still. Um, but don't don't age yourself there. Yeah, yeah that's a yeah, that's a good point. I completely <laughs> aged myself, um, or that I'm watching CNBC. But um, yeah, so we thought about what do we want to do, and how do we want to set up the framework for 
the way this kind of came down the pipeline. And, and it really goes back to we're really evaluating how can we help somebody in the, the short and the long term, because this was a potential partnership flip option that we'll talk about in more detail. And, and again, there's so many ways for clients to succeed and, and half the battle is saying, you know what, this one just doesn't make sense and let's all get off on the right foot and save ourselves for a, a good profitable opportunity. Okay, so this yeah. deal itself was a uh, was a partnership flip that you were gonna do with a, a partner or a student, right? Correct, somebody had come to us and said, actually heard you guys um, on the podcast, um, tell me more about the partnership flip. And so I thought I'd kind of walk through how that works and then that'll put in framework how this person was thinking about we could work together. So this is a perfect example of the partnership flip is where that the client brings us the property. So in many instances, it's either they've got a rental property that they want to sell as a one-off, they've got a family property that has been in a bit of disrepair. Um, we work with a lot of senior citizens, maybe mom and dad are moving into assisted living, hoarding, whatever the circumstance is, is they've got a good asset, but they don't have the capability to flip it and they don't have the ability to get top dollar. So again, the client brings us the property, we determine an as-is price, no matter how bad the property is, we say here's the value and it's based on comparable sales and the condition of the home. So that's the starting point. We then put our time and money and energy into renovating the property so the client doesn't have to lift a finger, spend any money, um, get outside their comfort zone, or even sometimes with experienced people, um, over improve actually, because our whole goal is we're agnostic. We're, we're typically standing back from that particular property and we don't have that emotional investment, especially if it's, let's say, a family home. Um, we're just kind of that expert that says, based on the numbers, this is the way we think we can maximize profit and do it in the most efficient time. So again, we invest our time and our money and then we sell the property for the client on the back end. I've got two associates on my team that are licensed agents, so we can sell that at a discount for clients um, to put more money back in that profit pool. And then at closing, the client gets the as is price that we've already agreed to and 50% of the extra net profit. So that's the framework of how the partnership flip works. This specific instance came to us where it was actually um, sent to a prospective client. Um, we're not working with this person, but we hope to help them at some point if, if they'd like the help. Um, and it was from a wholesaler. Those deals sometimes get a little bit thin from a partnership flip perspective and we'll talk about that why here in a minute, um, but but it can work from time to time from wholesalers. So I don't want to discount that, but this particular opportunity, which was up in Longmont, um, was delivered to us as a potential partnership flip. And I said, of, of course, let's look at the numbers and see if it's something that makes sense. Um, this one was a significant, complete remodel. So. There were some structural problems that we would have to handle. The layout was really rough in this property, so we would definitely have to redo um, layout and change some wall arrangements. So there'd be some structural reconfiguration as well as fixing foundation and, and then 100% rehab. There was absolutely nothing that was salvageable. This property was, I believe, just over 100 years old. Mm -hmm. And so we had to hit every major system, every cosmetic component to it. Um, and also a two-car garage and then tons of landscaping as well. So it was a, a significant property. Random question for all the houses in Longmont, mm -hmm. are they are they brick construction up there? Like that age that, that age group of like Denver is or you know, exterior like? it it varies. We've only done one property in Longmont um, and it went really well. That was a uh, 1950s ranch with siding. Okay. Uh, I don't know, and this is 100% not um, a bit of a guess in that there probably wasn't quite as strict of zoning. And so people were definitely able to build various houses. So they've got beautiful kind of classic turn of the century brick homes. They've got, you know, the regular ranches. They've got some tutors. They've got some stucco. They kind of have a cross section of everything. Um, this particular property is more that older farmhouse type okay. of property um, that, that could have been cool, but again, needed a lot of reconfiguration, which is doable, but it's just extra time and money. And we just have to be realistic on how much it's going to take and how long. Yeah. Okay. So he, he brought you this deal. Yep. And I mean, did he just like forge the email? Did he already have it under contract? Like, did he control the deal yet? He, he did. Um, we were in between actually looking at trying to think of the exact formula. He had sent us the deal. I was in between meetings and it was just, hey, do you want to talk about a partnership flip? My assumption was they had some connection to the property, not per a wholesaler. So I said, of course. 
I get out of my meeting. I quickly look at the deal. Um, I double check my comps with the two guys on my team and say, am, am I missing something? I, I don't see it. They double checked our comps as well. And I said, if you haven't put down hard earnest money, because many wholesalers, the earnest money is hard, let alone not doing a sewer scope. Um, I said, A, unfortunately, we can't partner with you because we don't see this as a profitable project. And B, if you cannot do it, I would back away from the deal. Um, and uh, he had put hard earnest money down. Mm-hmm. Um, so he was at an inflection point. So then I scheduled a follow-up call later that evening to, to walk through exactly why we're seeing what we're seeing. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, the client said, what would you do if you're in my shoes? And, and I said, um, you know, actually, I'll save what I'm going to say here to the end. I don't want to spoil our, right. the rest of our presentation. But, um, yeah, they were, they were committed. Um, but we can also talk about is it worth, after you've gone back and analyzed the deal, to stay in the deal and, and hope and think you're going to make money or back to what we recorded in our book um, segment, sometimes it might be better to take a loss as in, forfeit hard earnest money and put your money towards something that's profitable and, okay. and more certain, I guess. Yep. Yeah. All right. So we're, um, so I'm assuming you got the deal and then you ran it through your spreadsheet. Like tell me Correct. Like, when he, when you emailed it, what did you do? Yeah. So he emailed it to me. It was with the wholesaler packet. And I want to say that this is a caveat. This is not here to bash wholesalers. We work with a lot of wholesalers and a lot of them are really, really good. Um, I, I, at a minimum, I buy one or two deals a year, every year from a wholesaler and have for the last six years. So I think that's huge. I also think that um, in some of the classes that you know the folks at your castle teach, there's also not a massive discount um, because a wholesale is typically gonna be kind of run up to market value and sometimes MLS properties can be negotiated down. So there really is, he's analyzed, you know, you know, Lon as well as anybody, amazing amounts of data and there's not a huge difference. So I think for those out there, look at wholesaler deals, 100% be on their list, but jumping at every one of them, especially if it's perceived um, or is an off market deal, meaning it's not listed on the MLS, doesn't mean it's this amazing home run. So yeah, the packet was forwarded to me from the wholesaler, which is the information about the house. And then most wholesalers on average pull four comps. And then in the body of the email, they just say, here's the purchase price. Here's what our rehab is, uh, or their estimation for the rehab is, and here's where they think they can sell it on the back end. Um, How they get to those rehab numbers, again, it's like anything. There's good investors, there's bad investors. There's good lenders, there's bad lenders. Great wholesalers, not so good at wholesalers. You just have to be really careful on how they're determining how much it's going to cost to fix up the property. So that's all we got is we got four or five numbers, um, their comparable sales, which we looked at, no no deal analysis, no spreadsheet, very few um, run it through that way because they don't think of it from a flipper's perspective. Yeah. It's from a wholesaler's perspective. And again, there's value there. But in this instance, it's like, here you go. Good luck. Do you want the deal or not? And you had um, some pictures in there too, right? Yep, there were yeah. definitely there was a Google Drive folder, so yeah. that was the great thing. There was probably thirty pictures. Oh, that's a good amount. It's a really good amount, and they did a really good job with that, so that I could analyze the deal and not have to feel like I needed to drive up to Longmont. So yeah, then we put it through our kind of rigorous process, which is look at every picture, come up with a budget. And in our elevation system, we've got a one-page budget sheet that we can do by just looking at pictures and get about 90% spot on for how much the project is going to cost to rehab it. Um, Based on the scope of work, we then put in uh, an amount of time that it's going to take us to rehab that property. And then we put it in our deal analyzer spreadsheet that we'll walk through here in a second. But it's a really detailed spreadsheet that, that gives people firm numbers on how much profit are they projected to make, what's their return on investment. And our metric that's actually most important to us is dollars per day, which is the net amount of profit that a client or us is going to make on a daily basis. So yeah, then we ran the deal through our deal analyzer. um, And I've got two different slides that we could talk about. I've got what the deal would be if we use the numbers that we were provided, um, which is one version. And then our next slide that we'll get to in a minute is what we think that the actual analysis was. And and let's just say they're, they're two different things. So, if again, this is where we're going to spreadsheet, guys. So if you want to uh, see it, click the show notes. Uh, these two screenshots will be will be in the blog post. Yep. Um, 
Okay, so I'm looking at the comps we're going to spreadsheets. They got four comps at 453 to 590. Yep. It's quite the spread on some quite comps the there. Quite the spread. Um, going back almost a year. Mm-hmm. And one comp with the two comps, for, high end comps were 510 and 590. Correct. A four bedroom, two bath layout, and a three bedroom, three, three bedroom, four bathroom layout. Right. And how many bedrooms and baths for this house? So the subject property was listed as one, or excuse me, yeah, one bathroom, three bedrooms. It was a small farmhouse that each level, no basement, um, or no basement with finishable square footage, um, more storage and crawl space. Um, so you had a main floor, which was, um, let's see, the total building was just under 1,500 total square feet. So you're right around 750 on the main level, and then you're right around 750 square feet on a second story. But talking through their configuration of these old farmhouses is a lot of times the stairwell is really, really teeny to get you up to mm. the upper area. So either you spend way more money and put a dormer on, on the top of the property to give you more light and more accessible square footage, or you stick with what you've got and you, you can't compete with these very nicely laid out bungalows or ranches or regular two stories. Yeah, so I, it sounds like that it's going to be a far cry off at 590 com. I, I think so. And, and I think that that was kind of the tough thing that when we looked at it at first glance, and, and I really want to kind of stress that um, comping, and I know you guys look at it from a rental perspective too, I mean, there is lots of data we can all focus on. But at the end of the day, there's a little nuance to it, and there's a little bit of a gut feel, no matter how much you, data you analyze. But I, I oh, think yeah. that you can you know narrow your target and look at something and be super realistic. And let's just use this example. The client was presented a 3-1, Best case scenario, we could add a bathroom and make it a 3-2, but they also presented it to the client that you could make it a large two-bedroom, two-bath. So the comps that we're looking at, the high-end comps um, that are over $500,000 are four beds, two baths, and three baths, or excuse me, three bedrooms and four bathrooms. So you really are looking at apples to apples. We don't completely throw those out the window per se, but we just know we have to sell way, way less because we have half of the livable um, bedroom and bathroom configuration. And it, and it's just a, it's a bit of a stretch. And if you, I mean, if you're selling a two bedroom, you generally take out a big chunk of the family buyer pool. You do. You usually want a minimum of a three bed, two bath. You do. You're, you're definitely going single person. You're going couple. You're going maybe one kiddo. But um, they're also potentially outgrowing that house too. Yeah. So a lot of people are going to, you know, kind of, even if they've got one, kiddo or they've got none, but they know they want to have two kids, you're missing that buyer profile too. So yeah, I mean, the general guidelines of what was presented to us was a purchase price of three fifteen, dollars a $95,000 renovation budget. Um, many folks in this industry don't do contingency budgets. So again, that's their all-in rehab number. We, we definitely do, and we'll walk through that here in a second. And then their ARV, um, which for a lot of your audience is the after repair value or what is going to the property is going to sell for, they had it at five hundred and twenty five thousand hmm. dollars. So at first glance, this would totally be a great deal. Um, and yeah, our, you got a nice spread there. It's a great spread. Um, our normal spreads for non structural, um, massive home remodels is about one hundred forty thousand um, dollars from what you're buying it to to what you're selling it to. When you're looking at major structural improvements, you want to be in that you know 165 to 175, hundred thousand dollar spread, and this has that. So at first glance, you're like, okay, this from the three bullet points that were provided, I guess this is good at you know 12 seconds worth of analysis. But when you dive deeper, it's definitely something that that we'd have to keep in mind. Um, and then when you work with wholesalers, again, we we love working with those guys if you've got some experience, but the typical close is, you know, 10 days to, to two weeks. Um, you've got earnest money that's hard, which means you are committing, you are writing a five to $10,000 check, whether you buy the property or not, your check is going to get cashed. Neither you close on it and purchase it, or you eat that um, fee. And, and then also you, you don't get to sewer scope it. So whenever we buy from wholesalers, we're grateful to see their inventory. We just personally add on the, the likelihood that we might have to do a sewer line. And if we don't, great, but that's a, you know, seven to $12,000 swing that can bust people's profits. Is it pretty typical for a uh, no sewer scope? Correct. Okay. Virtually all wholesalers will not do a sewer scope. Something that we do when we do our, and we don't do it a ton of wholesaling, um, but we do work with a, a closed 
um, group of, of other fellow investors. And to me, to pay an extra 125 bucks per property to know exactly what's going on, it helps me because either I'm going to buy it myself or the folks that we work with. I just want people to know what's going on. So we scope, but the vast majority of people do not. And a lot of that, to their credit, is because they're doing a volume game. Um, and it is a buyer beware. There is, you know, it is 100% disclosed. Like this is as is. You guys should know what you're doing, and and go that route. Um, you know, so you just got to factor it in. But but again, there's no sewer scope. So I'm always thinking, I'm pr- you know, especially in a hundred year old property, I'm probably gonna have to do the sewer. Yeah, uh, and so they're projecting the profit at just over fifty five thousand dollars. Correct. Okay. So doing their math. Um, it was a $55,000 profit. When we plugged it into our spreadsheet, we put it in at the client's numbers, which they were looking to borrow hard money. So that definitely affects the profit, which means they're going to pay uh, two points or 2% of the purchase price. Um, and then on average, they're going to pay about 12% in interest. So there's definitely some interest and some carrying costs um, that take out of the net profit. We then factor in selling it on the back end and include all of the um, real estate transaction costs. So insuring the property, um, title insurance, how much you're going to spend in closing costs to buy it, how much you're going to spend in closing costs to sell it, staging, taxes, I mean everything. So that is a true net number. So we've got our elevation deal analyzer that that spits out three numbers. And this specific property was a $55,000 profit. Um, which for us would be a green. Um, we do a yellow, red, green, and and it would be a good one. And it's um, just interesting. I know a lot of people have listened or watched to those the series we did back in January. And yeah. This is like the the top box of the daily burn ROI profit dollars per day that gives you the what like the red, orange, green yes. colors. Mm-hmm. It's like a looks good or yeah 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 looks good. You so know, the profit proceed. box is green at fifty five. Yep, profit box is green at fifty five. The ROI box is yellow at 11.72% in this specific example. So um, definitely not a a, a no-go, but kind of look at it and proceed with caution. Um, Or more so for us, it's all about, if I'm looking at two opportunities side by side, my simple analysis is when I plug in our numbers, ideally I want all three boxes to be green. If we've got some yellows, then we say, well, why is it yellow and which project do we want to go with? Um, And then in this one, uh, which is not a horrible return, but definitely we like to be at least above 12%, especially when you're all in for 315 plus at least, we'll talk about it here more in a minute, but over $100,000 in rehab. Um, you know, if you're putting in four hundred to $425,000, you want to make a good return on your money. And then for us, the most important metric is how long is it going to take us and what's going to be our net profit, so our dollars per day. And this one is 367 net dollars per day, which is, um, we typically like to be at least over $400 per day. Okay. So, so two yellows and one green. So where in here, maybe it's on a screenshot, because mm-hmm. you, you plug in the estimated holding time, or am I just missing it? What's we your... we do. We've got holding time in our rehab and financing costs. So in this one, um, the wholesaler estimated it to be a three-month project and then 30 days to sell. So the number of days we had as a hold time in this one um, was 150. Um, so actually that'd be a four month rehab and about a one month to sell, give or take. So yeah, all in, you're looking at five months to get that $55,000 in profit, almost 12% and $367 per day. And then you also got the, I mean, $55,000 profit total that spits out about 21,000 to client, yep. about 27 to elevation. Yep. Uh, yeah. I mean, so doesn't look too bad. Yeah, yeah, not not horrible. Um, this one starts to get a little thin for us because we are investing, let's call it $100,000 of our money to make $27,000. So the ROI is, is, is decent, but um, we try to get a little closer to where we're spending a little bit less money in rehab and ideally making a little bit more money. But again, we're very open to whatever opportunities that our clients send our way. Um, but it, yeah, again, you got two yellows and a green. So, hey, l- this is absolutely worth a little bit of a, a deeper dive versus yeah. if they all are red when we can do our f- two minutes worth of analysis, then we say, thanks, but it isn't a deal and, and move on. But this one, I said, let's let's look into it a little deeper. Okay. I'm curious to see your, your spreadsheet. Yeah. So so now on the next slide, I'll be curious to see what your audience thinks. Um, oh, of, lots of, of red. Deal or no deal. Um, for us, this is red. This is 100% red. Yeah. 
completely across the board. And there's a couple different reasons. And again, I'm, I'm keeping my eye on this property because, you know, I've been wrong before. So maybe this is something that, that does sell where people think it's less money to rehab it. Historically for us, that absolutely never happens. So for us, it, it is all three red and it, it is literally losing money. It's not red as in I'm only making $27,000 in profit if we wanted to make forty five. dollars um, The way we projected this is it's a straight up loss and you're spending tons of money to lose money in this example. So what we looked at it as, again, we're fortunate that we've got experience and we can look at photos or definitely do it in person and have a really good sense of rehab. Um, we do have our bu budget estimating sheet that we share with clients and we can teach them how to do this. But my rehab was $115,000 and there were three reasons. One, the property was over 100 years old and, and literally the foundation was built on boulder and mortar, not even concrete mm -hmm. cinder block or a poured concrete foundation. And there was shifting going on there. So you'd have to have structural improvements. Um, you could see on some of the uh, duct work that there was asbestos that would have to be remediated. Um, again, I knew based on just the general condition of the home that every major system is shot. So new roof, new windows, this age of property, you might be looking at some lead-based paint, so again, more expensive to do. I'm almost positive you have to do a sewer scope or sewer line, doing a updated electrical panel. Um, so you're, you know, furnace, hot water heater, you're doing everything. And when we know every major system is shot, um, we're starting our 57th project here um, next week, and and they're almost always six-figure rehabs. Um, so again, you look at every major system shop. The other big thing is, is when you're doing this much work, you 100% need to pull permits. So not only to make sure you're putting out a good product to the end buyer, but um, to make sure that you're doing things properly. And that is absolutely going to add time to your project. So the way that we estimated this is a five-month project to get it done because we know that permits don't happen fast. Um, we did one in Longmont, and it was not fast. Um, that's also a little bit of hedged uncertainty into maybe COVID popping up in the fall. So I don't know if cities are going to be open to approve permits too. Mm -hmm. So I think, again, some people probably say, it shouldn't take you five months and a month to sell it. Okay, great. So I'm wrong by a month. It's still something to be cautious of. Um, but then you're in a, a, a late fall listing date as well. That's exactly it. Uh, that's literally my number one bullet point of analysis is, okay, let's say best case scenario, you know, we buy this thing mid-June. We're in mid-July, August, and September, best case to finish it. The reality is, is you're probably listing in uh, early October, best case scenario. I personally think the realistic scenario is you're listing in November, which is definitely not the right time to list or you you can we sell properties year round but you have to sell for less so random thought here for because i, I yeah. know the seasonal stuff but then mm -hmm. since this is november mm -hmm. and the four-year presidential election cycle good point did you ding that even more because historically like things you know just yeah everyone gets i guess I don't know, depressed or mad at right. election or whatever it is but like yeah it slows down no you're right actually that's a great point i didn't really even discount it more for that but that's super realistic so we've got a lot of things that are not working in our yeah. favor of, of selling that property and in that's November. Just out of your control. It's 100 percent out of our control, and we we will within two weeks of Thanksgiving, we absolutely do not list anything. If we're buying properties and we know we've planned that they're going to be on the market at the time, we lose a minimum of two weeks in November because people are just not looking at houses, and then we book three weeks in the uh, December January holiday season because we know the traffic is way down. So we 100 percent have to factor for that. And then I also put in there a bullet point. Again, I don't know. I'm not an epidemiologist, obviously. Um, but I think there's a lot of data out there that says that we could have another flare up um, and, and business could be altered in the fall. And so I'm thinking, again, do I want to be selling a half a million dollar house? Um, probably not. It's got to be more of a home run type of a profit. Um, and then the final thing was, Again, looking at the configuration of the house, I think it's a huge stretch to get it to a, a really good functional three-bedroom, two-bathroom. And even if you do, you're making really small bedrooms, and you're not as nice um, as the other comparable sales that were offered up as, oh, yeah, you can hit this comp no problem, that were way more straightforward and nicely laid out. So it, it's just a... Um, 
it, it, it's really a tough one. And so I'll, I'll give the specific numbers. When we looked at our comps, we looked at five deals and they ranged uh, in price from 300,000 to 453. Mm. So again, big, big difference of going back to what was proposed as four deals between 453 and 590. The only common comp that we had was the 453. Yeah, your upper end and their lower end, huh? I, exactly. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's not rocket science. So there's one common deal. And um, again, you just have to be more cautious. And what they were saying is that the client could sell it for 525, no problem. Again, we don't normally pick the very top comp um, for, for many different reasons. But in this instance, you, you can't create the same type of house. So again, I put the ARV at 500. I, I'm being super generous. If I'm buying this property myself, I'm maxing out at probably $475,000. Um, but again, just to try to say, maybe I'm wrong, let's split the difference of them projecting it at 525, me thinking 475, let's put it in the middle. So even selling this property at $500,000 and a $315,000 purchase price, big, big jump in rehab, $115,000 in rehab plus a 10% contingency. So we're in it for 125. Um, having it be a six month project is you lose $5,797. You have a negative 1.15% ROI and I'm losing $32 every day that I own that property. And the worst thing about it is I could put $400,000 to work in either one flip or let's call it two condos and make substantially more than that without all of these different risk factors. So for us, um, as Howie Mandel would say, is this is no deal, man. This is rough. Yeah, and this is, I mean, as you see on the spreadsheet there, this is, I mean, this is best case scenario. Yeah. And you're losing six grand. And so if there's more of that 475, which sounds like that might be pushing if you're I think so in November, too. Yep. you might be in there for what, thirty to fifty thousand dollar loss then. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I really think so. And, and I think people could argue and say, well, I'm gonna do ha I'm gonna do some of the work and I could get it for cheaper. Uh, okay, great. So you rehab it for ninety and you still think that's the best case scenario. Okay. If something, you know, the, the clouds part and 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 you know, you have divine intervention, you make ten thousand dollars, but you've spent four hundred grand in six months. I mean, you know me, revert back to my fixed income days buy a municipal bond and make tax free at zero, you know, virtually zero risk and zero work. I mean, if you're thinking of generating general market returns, you are doing the wrong thing in investing in real estate. Yeah. So, okay. So no deal. And when you, no deal. when you, uh, I know you said you got the first email in between meetings Yes. and you glanced at it and you sat down and do it. How long did it take you to <clears throat> pull your comps and plug in numbers. Like, is that a, a 30 minute process for you? A two hour process? No, probably a, yeah, about a 20 minute process. Okay. Yeah. On average, about a 20 minute process. And I really wanted to spend more time and say, what, what am I missing? And I looked at the two really high comps and said, again, we're not, we're not that same property. We are, you know, on one property, it was 200 square feet smaller on another property it was 350 square feet smaller. And again, you're a minimum of one bed and one bath smaller. So you, it, it's that Daniel, my project manager, has a, a great quote, and he calls it apples to spinach. It's like, <laughs> man, you're, you're comparing two different things. It's just, it's not that cliche apples to apples or even close. So again, I want to know that data, but I can't, I can't sell that, you know? And, and they were really um, pitching that there was a singular comp that had listed way, way too high in the sixes and had to come all the way down and close at 507. Oh, that was a really nicely done house. Again, better layout, better. Um, was that a rehab property? It was too? a rehab property. It was done really, really well. And their <clears throat> argument was, well, if it had been listed properly out of the gate, no problem, 525 probably would have even sold for more, which, you know, when things are priced properly, that typically happens. But again, we're talking about best case scenario for a bigger, nicer house. Um, and we definitely cast a wide net in Longmont. Um, normally, we want to focus on you know quarter mile and half mile radius to pull our comps. Um, I think people in Longmont, at least this is what we found in our flip, they are not quite as super neighborhood specific. They're looking in a wider radius because it's a smaller town. Yeah. And so for a really nice fixed up product, I want to know that something that's a mile and a half away is selling for either way more than I think or way less than I think because people are definitely have a wider search radius versus in Denver. 
you know, if you want to live in a suburb of Englewood, that's all you want to live in, and, and you're in a small radius. This one, we definitely pulled wider comps. I'm sure people would say, well, you need to just look at that area. Well, there wasn't a ton in that area, so we just we want more data. And that's just kind of how we came up with this. And unfortunately for us, it was it would have been a hundred percent loss. And you said you had your uh, your team just double check things to yes. make sure missing. Like, how long did that take them to look at? Did it? Did, do they do the, their own full analysis, or they just have them look at comps? Like, it's more. What do they do? Yeah, I the way I love that you have like a. a the back end helped us double check. Yes, you. it really is. I kind of segment it into two fashions. My um, business development manager, Brandon, he looks at more of the comp and the sales price point to make sure that we're realistic in what we think we can sell it for. And then Daniel, my project manager, who's phenomenal at running the projects in the construction side, he looks at the pictures again and says, you know what, I think this is either a realistic or an unrealistic rehab. Um, they are both savvy and can do you know, we're cross-training them, so Brandon can still look at it mm. and say, man, this this just seems like we're going to spend more money in rehab. And Daniel can absolutely say, no, I, I think the ARV is off. So we do cross-train, but for us, each one of them probably spent 15 minutes kind of just making sure that, that I wasn't, you know, missing anything. And, and then, again, I, I kind of lost some sleep over this one at night thinking, did I miss something? And then the, the client ran it past a couple other people and they also on the on their own and said no actually they said avoid this one this the numbers don't make sense so this wasn't at least in my opinion a random outlier where i'm mr conservative which i'd rather be mr conservative and profitable in business than best case scenario guy yeah so, so obviously this was this was a no deal this was a no deal okay so 100%. what uh, i'm guessing he wasn't your client wasn't excited about that since he no. put down hard earnest money he he did and this is where i 100 percent want to give credit to um the wholesale companies i said gosh if, if you can do that um see if you can get the money back and and here's the interesting thing is if there's if it's a deal there will be a person there'll be a line 10 miles long of people that want that deal oh, yeah. so big picture let's all think about how can we do the right business with one another and they did give him his earnest money back which is huge and i totally commend them for doing That's that respectable i, mean, I, I totally agree i would imagine a lot would not no there's been absolutely times where the earnest money has been significantly more than that and they don't get it back again we're all big boys and big girls in this business we need to kind of own what hard earnest money means but these guys definitely deserve some credit um, so he got the earnest money back thank goodness and was able to um, look at it and say you know what after talking to you after talking to a couple other people um, sleeping on it a night or two they were super glad that they didn't move forward and and this is the kind of stuff where hopefully you don't put down hard earnest money but th these are the deals we run across all the time and and again we just see them very very differently than than some of the folks out there. Great. Uh, I mean, so this was a great job you did. I appreciate you sharing yeah, it. Of course. And I do like the way you did the, the deal or no deal. Right. So for the listeners out there, I'd be curious to hear, because I, I, as I mentioned at the beginning, I want to do a lot more deal analysis. Yeah. Also doing a lot more rental stuff, which yep. is my wheelhouse. But then, you know, Derek's in a whole, whole different trench mm -hmm. in Denver real estate investing and bringing on some more flipping stuff. So I'd love to hear you guys' feedback, interest, yeah. format. What other questions or details do you guys have? And we'll start incorporating those into future uh, deal analyses. So, of course, always go to the website, find the deal analyses button on there, and you can filter out fix and flips as we add them now yep. and all the other property types. So, uh, Derek, this is great knowledge. Uh, anything else you're going to wrap up with before we end here? No, I, I mean, I just appreciate you having me on so we can go over these and it's going to be fun. You're right. We've got an, another one or two deal or no deal scenarios versus the, the overall case studies that will, you know, show your audience of which ones we do move forward with. And then we're kind of like you guys, we want to be able to just help as many people as possible. So we've got, you know, coinciding, you know, education that we're doing and doing free classes through, um, you know, Zoom meetings. We're doing, we're starting back up kind of in a a respectful manner um, on on site and in the field, um, you know, meetups to show people what we're doing. We want to do business with a lot of people. So when people have stuff, it's like send it our way and we'll give you the whether people like to hear it or not kind of our analysis. And again, we're not, you know, the only people that do this and we do it, I think, a little differently. But it's all about just how can we co-educate one another and do more business together. Great. Well, thank you. Thank As a reminder, all the notes, images are in the show notes. And I forgot to mention the beginning, the deal analyzer spreadsheet. 
that's when you can download off the website or email Derek to yeah. get it as well. But like that's definitely one of your freebies you give away. Yep. And it's a it's a slick spreadsheet that you updated I think a month or two yeah, ago. Yeah, we just too. did a new update. So yeah, make sure you guys grab that. All right, guys. Well, thank you for listening. Derek, thank you. Thanks, Chris. We'll talk to you guys all soon.